Science faction is meant for an adult audience. All likeness to persons living or dead are the result of purposeful slander. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 276. Science Faction, the origin of the planets. Of which there is billions upon billions and billions. Thank you, Carl Sagan, for jumping in here. Wait, are you a dead scientist, or are you just... <laughs> Of course, I being summoned at the beginning of the show, since we did not block off time at the end of the show. That's there right. was no, like, weird noises and candle lighting. How did you get here? Yeah, you didn't say the word spirit, says you were shaking. It, it <laughs> happened off mic, and the way that you guys are blowing this fantasy to the fans <laughs> is playing with the fourth is, wall. Yeah, in no fourth way. wall. <laughs> Uh, indeed, we are talking about the origin of the planets. We have already covered in our new The Origins of series, the origins of the universe, the origins of stars, the origins of the solar system, and the next logical step, the origin of the planets. And it is kind of interesting. Every time I look at this kind of stuff, I have kind of a conceptual framework of how this works in my head from things that I have learned throughout my life. Every time I have to do the back research to kind of make sure I have everything right and I have the most up-to-date information, I always learn new stuff. So this was kind of interesting because I learned a lot of new stuff on this particular one myself. So when we left off, we had had the Big Bang. We talked about all that stuff that happened right after the Big Bang and the super hot universe that was going on for hundreds of thousands of years before it cooled off. Did you guys talk off. about the turtles yet? Yeah, oh, turtles everything. all the way down. Oh, the hot yeah. turtles? Yeah. yeah, well, that's <laughs> your jumping, Bill, on our planet formation. We don't have to talk about the turtles till we talk about what Earth is resting on. Next episode is the teacup. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, teapot, I believe. <laughs> So in looking at this, we, we talked about how after, you know, a couple hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, it finally coalesced and got cool enough that the plasma state fell into what is more typical matter state and the universe became transparent and the formation of stars with the accumulation of hydrogen. And then we talked about that accretion disk in terms of the formation of solar systems, which is basically a big flat disk of matter that's been spread out. And it slowly coalesces based on gravity into the planets. Now, I thought that simple story was basically it for planet formation. That is what I had always thought. But when in looking at this, it's really interesting. So imagine we have this sun burning bright. We have this accretion disk, so a flat disk of material that kind of stretches out. Almost think like a really, really large version of Saturn's rings stretching out across the solar system coming out from the sun. Well, as the sun starts burning brightly and this accretion disk is moving around, they start doing the same thing. The accretion disk starts doing the same thing that the sun had done, which is gravity is pulling parts of it together to form clumps, to form these balls. One thing that I didn't realize until I was doing this back research is, why is it that we have these gas giants like Jupiter all the way out on the outskirts, but we have the rocky planets in the interior? Why would that be? And it turns out the reason is the sun burns so hot that it essentially pushes or burns or keeps away all of those gaseous water type materials that are in the inner part and it leaves just these terrestrial rocky materials on the outside so when the earth and mercury and venus and all of these things formed there was no water on them they formed as dry terrestrial rocky planets so what you're saying is earth can take the heat yeah. We're a badass motherfucker. We are. Planet. Because we're we have a lot of iron and a lot of heavy elements and a lot of big terrestrial materials that make up our planet. So Jupiter's big, but it's really just a big fucking pussy. That's right. Jupiter is like that big fat kid. You can push him around if you want. It's Hodor. Yeah. The sun's solar winds pushed all of that material out into the outskirts and kept the lighter stuff from from forming in. So we don't have those gas giants in the interior solar system because of that process. And then you might say, well, wait a second. And we'll just jump ahead a little bit here. Wait a second. Then how come Earth is covered in water? How come 70 some odd percent of our surface is covered in water? All of that is additions later on. So for a long time, the Earth was circling around the sun completely dry, just as we look up right now and see places like Mars are completely dry now. What ended up happening is these icy objects, these comets and asteroids from the outer solar system, came crashing in after that point and deposited all that water there. So think about it. All the water that is on Earth wasn't around here when Earth formed. It essentially was sent here piece by piece by flying asteroids and comets but that, that was, were... Uh, it was pretty, pretty soon after the formation yes. of Earth, right? Yeah. Because the Earth has been around for what, like 4 billion years? 4.6. Something like that. 4.5, um, something like that. But life started like not that right. far after it formed. Yeah, yeah. And, and we would have needed water. 
for life to form. Exactly. But all of that is imported. You know, Earth yeah. formed itself dry, which is something I didn't know and I think is incredibly interesting. And it wasn't until you get these, you know, Amazon deliveries of water from the outer solar <laughs> system come crashing in and we get – that's how all the water came. Not just a little bit, not a few lakes or ponds. All of it came from these extraterrestrial impacts. And speaking of extraterrestrial impacts, we talked last week in the formation of the solar system about one of the things that made Earth the way it is, which was at the time there were many more bodies in the inner solar system. So it wasn't just Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. No, you had a lot, hundreds of them that were slowly coalescing. One of them that was the same size as Mars, a whole other planet, ended up around 4.4 maybe, 4.5 billion years ago, crashing into Earth in what had to be the biggest cataclysmic reaction that has ever occurred in our solar system other than the, the birth of the sun itself. These things crashed together. It threw out a whole bunch of material, which later coalesced into what we now call the moon. And it also formed the current Earth. Before then, you had two separate planets, basically, that combined together to make the Earth. We were born, just like we as individuals are born, of the birth of two parent planets creating the yeah. Earth. Two crotches smashing together. What? <laughs> what? Bang. They, they went <laughs> bang, wrong? right? Is that they, that? Yeah. They were just planets. Wait, but, Thea, but, but, but you, what, what, is, what is the word Thea come it's from? A, it's like a Greek god. Yeah, yeah goddess, yeah. maybe? Maybe, yeah. 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 Or, I don't know, Mother Earth. Maybe it was a lesbian relationship. <laughs> Together, we survived. Out of those hundred planets, yeah. we, co we, co we went back to back, ass to ass, yeah. if you will, <laughs> and fought off the rest of the planets. And brought them in. Because again, just like all the water that came in from outside, a lot of those little planetoids that were running around ended up getting swallowed up by the Earth. Because as it makes its rotation through this orbit, and keep in mind, at this point, this early solar system that we're talking about, the formation of these planets, these are very irregular orbits. Every time it has an extraterrestrial impact, it changes the orbit and the orbital velocity that it has because you're in space. So if two planets collide, it's not like early Earth and Theia were going at the speed the Earth is now. The, the speed the Earth is now is the result of that collision. You know, and, and same thing with the moon. The speed that the moon is moving is the result of that collision. A lot of people don't realize that the moon is actually moving further and further away from us. So at some point, we will eventually lose the moon. It'll probably go outside of our gravitational pull and get taken off elsewhere. What will we do with consistent ocean tides? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, well, it's also part of the coincidence where the... The moon is almost exactly the visual size yes. of the sun so that we get a yeah. good eclipse. Right now it is. Forever. Yeah, right now Right it now is. it is. In the time of the dinosaurs, it was not. The moon looked much larger because it was actually much closer. It, it goes like, I think it's like a few centimeters a year. It gets it goes further and further away. I would have thought it was just because they were bigger so the moon was closer to them. That's right. They were taller up. <laughs> They're up really high. It's the same reason the, the moon looks bigger in Denver. <laughs> exactly. That's why they called Denver Big Moon Country. <laughs> State motto. <laughs> Meanwhile, while that was going on in the interior solar system, in the outer solar system, the solar winds had pushed a lot of the materials out there, a lot of the gaseous materials, and Jupiter is the size it is, as opposed to everything around it, not necessarily because it had some great start to it. It probably started out as the same size as things like Saturn and Uranus and Neptune and stuff. The actual difference is it just started earlier. So what we think happened is Jupiter was the first large gaseous planetoid to start out there, and it just accrued a lot of stuff earlier and earlier. Things Earth's like big, fat, worthless older brother. Right. Yeah, like Saturn formed later, and because of that, it is smaller. It's not because there was some kind of, that we think at least, that it was some kind of inherent difference in the two. It was just that because it started forming later, it didn't have as much time, and the solar winds had reached out at that point that far, and either Jupiter had collected most of the matter that was out there, or it got pushed out even further off you know, into the Kuiper belt. And so basically Jupiter is the size it is because it's old. It's like a reptile. You know how reptiles keep growing their entire life? It's like that. It's, it's the size it is because of that. And we actually think they switched around their orbits quite a bit. We don't think we got the same steady solar system until Jupiter and Saturn became a two to one orbit ratio, meaning two rotations for every one. And at that point, their gravities kind of stabilized those orbits. Do you think Saturn talks trash to Jupiter each time? Like, you get lap, bitch. <laughs> Or was it the other way around? It's the other way around. Jupiter's like, my mass controls you. <laughs> Bitch. And then you have moons that form. Now, we talked about how our moon likely formed from that collision with Theia, but that's not the only way moons can form. Moons can form from accretion disks of their own. So the same way the planets formed out of the accretion disk around the sun, planets themselves can have accretion disks around them that then coalesce into their moons. Is ours just the moon? Does our accretion yeah. just, just one consist of one Well, ours, thing? the accretion disk that came from the impact of Theia became just the moon. And then there might have been smaller bodies that either got drawn into the moon or into our own body and after does that. Does that mean 
mentioned that the rings of Saturn will eventually collect at some point. Good point. That is what we thought about 20 years ago. We thought eventually there would be no more rings of Saturn because eventually that would happen. However, more... 20 years later, I'm still kicking. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, no, what happened is we've actually sent probes through those rings and we've seen that what ends up happening is they end up coalescing and then decoalescing in a really complicated fashion that makes us think the system is actually sustainable and their rings will continue to be the way they are. And it has to do with... That must be such a small space in the like... Space of possible yes. accretion disks. And you know that, what like, makes just that stays po- the way it is. Well, what makes that possible is the moons of Saturn, which have a complementary gravitational effect the other way, which help keep that accretion disk spread out. Because Saturn, like Jupiter, has many moons, some of which are quite large. You know, some of the moons of Jupiter are the size of planets here, you know. And those are large ones. We talked about it forming from an accretion disk or an impact, but one of the other ways moons form, which is also really interesting, is sometimes the gravity of a large planet like Jupiter will just capture a passing body. So you have an asteroid coming through, a very large one. The moon's gravity captured it, and now it's one of its moons. And what's interesting about that is, if you think of the way an accretion disk works, an accretion disk is you know a flat grouping of matter surrounding the actual planet. It's spiraling, and it coalesces, right? So that means that all of those moons are spinning in the same direction once they reach orbit. However, a passing asteroid doesn't. A passing asteroid would be very unlikely to be in the exact same orbital velocity as everything else, and the exact same orbital rotation. So there are places like Jupiter where you have a group of moons that are all formed by an accretion disk, and they're spinning around in the same orbit in the same area, and then it captures a random moon that comes from a totally different angle and spins at a totally different orbit. Like a Pokemon. Yeah, it's got to catch them all. <laughs> I, I had thought that analogy through really well, but as it kept going, like it, it made less and less sense. So. <laughs> you just I, got I was to throw it in at one, some point. Just like a Pokeball. Yeah. <laughs> So that's really interesting because it means you can have these large planets with a whole bunch of moons spinning in one direction, then two or three just kind of doing their own thing. The reason that's really interesting is those two or three moons that are doing their own thing, if they're in a totally different orbital velocity, totally different orbital plane, they can smash into a different moon at any given time if, you know, the math adds up correctly. So that's really, really interesting. This is an instructional video. If you're a moon, don't do your own thing because it leads to disaster for the whole team. (laughs) Teamwork amongst this moon. Eventually, the solar system kind of stabilized and all the planets got their pretty much stable orbits, which we see today. But that was not how it always was. We actually think some of the planets switched orbits, switched order from the sun based on weird gravitational swings. Jupiter swings Neptune around and now it's on the outside. Or the particular orbits of two planets line up in some kind of weird way that changes kind of their velocity or their relation to one another. It's really interesting. But basically, if you think of the early solar system, it was chaos. There were things coming in from outside, things being pushed outside from inside, massive planetary bodies smashing into each other, the formation of these moons, the capture of other asteroids as moons, really eccentric orbits that sometimes swap places. And then eventually you kind of get the stable orbits you have now. It's almost like, you know, if you were to take a big jar of marbles and dump them all on the ground, At the point they hit the ground, they have this maximum amount of kind of random energy going off in every single direction. But soon, all of those marbles will settle, if you imagine a version of doing this in space. Soon, all those marbles will settle into, after they're done bouncing into one another, into all the objects around them, they'll settle into a pretty straight trajectory going in one direction. Bill, don't ever watch Home Alone with Bobby because for every prank, he has to sit there and analyze it like that. Stop the movie. See, when Kevin poured the marbles onto the ground, that was simulating our galaxy and the solar system. (laughs) What about the paint can one? What was that? I was going to say that the moon is actually a lot like taking a blowtorch to a door handle because (laughs) you... You're affecting something from afar without directly touching it. And Joe Pesci's not a fan. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and speaking of somebody Joe Pesci's not a fan of, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. And with me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? I would like to be referred to as the Daniel Stern and the other half of the Sticky Bandits for the rest of this episode. <laughs> you are a Sticky Bandit for a completely different reason. And our scientist for the evening is none other than Dr. Bill. Dr. Bill, how are you doing? I'm... Not doing so great, but I'm glad that the llama vaccines are coming along. Yes, that's I've, right. I have been very sick for five days. Yeah, uh, you, Thank uh, you for you, coming to the studio. Yeah, yes. <laughs> you're welcome. And is it a flu or a cold or uh, what do you have? Probably just a cold, but I haven't taken my temperature. So ah, okay. I feel a lot better today. I got my rectal thermometer. If, uh, I mean, <laughs> oh, I, keep, I don't nice. even keep it in my car. It's in my wallet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say it was in your rectum. Oh, currently. no. It looks like a condom, but it's <laughs> it's a rectal thermometer, I promise. And if you want to order your own Science Faction rectal thermometer, check out our website at <laughs> www.thesciencefaction.com. We will see the links to all the articles we cover, as well as some we didn't get to. 
And if you want us to cover your particular ungoogleable question, you can tweet us at Faction Science. You heard it here. Rectal thermometers prevent teenage pregnancy. I mean... Because they were condoms. I That's- guess... I thought I thought the new street name for a condom was a rectal thermometer, and we had established that as canon on the show. All right, let's cut all this rectal thermometer talk. <laughs> right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is science articles. All right, article number one. I got a monopole for you right over here. Monopoles, those are the things that British nobility break when you say something uncouth. No, that's them. a monocle, Damien. Oh, monocle. Okay, yeah. Wait, they break them? Why would they? Why would they their eyes, they, what I see through. My word. And no. they pass out in the monocle. Break. Yeah, it's, oh, it, they're so shocked, their eyes open widely, thereby dislodging uh, the monocle. So it's not like they're breaking them in anger. Like, no, it's no, more of a shocked response. Yeah. yeah they can. Their inability to cope with things that you and I have to deal with every sure, day. Sure, sure. Uh, so this is just as a warning to our uh, listeners, this is very <laughs> physics-heavy episode today. For, so for those of you guys who uh, who love physics like me, you'll like it. For those of you guys who don't, uh, just wait till Thursday when we have I Call BS come out. Uh, that'll be a little bit less physics-y. Can't wait till Thursday. So to start off with, monopoles are a really interesting idea in physics. It's basically a magnet that only has one charge. So we've all played with magnets before. Every magnet has a north pole and a south pole, and they're equal and opposite charges for that particular magnet. So you can take two magnets and put them close to each other, and if the north pole is facing the south pole, you get an attraction. Those two will attract together. If the north pole is facing the other north pole, you'll get a a repelling, and those will force themselves away from each other. So we've all played with a bunch of magnets and seen those effects, right? If you were like me when you were a kid, you looked and went, wait a second, I just want the one force. Like, I just want the one that pushes, not the one that pulls. And so if you were an idiot kid like me, at six, you took a hammer out into your dad's garage and smashed a magnet apart to try and make just a single monopole. Yeah, you just cut it in half. Yeah, (laughs) that's what I did. I literally did. I used a hammer and a chisel, and I cut a magnet in half to try and make a monopole because I was an idiot. got two monopoles. What ends up happening is, just like Bill pointed out, you end up having two smaller magnets and a pissed off dad and a ruined hammer. (laughs) I was about to make a child abuse joke. (laughs) Yeah. Well, the problem is that magnets, as far as we know, only exist in this form. So no matter how many times you cut them in half, you're just going to get two smaller magnets. You'll never get a monopole. I remember learning this in physics at Berkeley, and the book was just like, we don't know why this is. Yeah. Just deal with it. Here's the math. Well, a the lot of at Stanford actually had a very detailed oh, explanation God damn it. <laughs> as to what the why a monopoles existed. A lot of a lot of magnet stuff is kind of like that. You know, when you talk to somebody and you say, "How does a magnet work?" I could give you the very basics of it. Okay, just like I told you, you know, you have a north pole and a south pole. It's the same force as electricity, basically, except when we use these magnets, it's basically a static thing. You don't need that that flow of electrons. But once you get into the details of how a magnet works. In fact, we don't know a lot. That very simple thing is not as easily explained as you may think. You know, you get to a point where you kind of run into a wall and there's not much you can say about it except for this is what we think. And magnets, those very simple things, are actually very complicated in that way, you know? So you're right. We don't know why this is. We don't know why every time you chop it in half, you don't get a single monopole. But it is the way it is. And so we've been looking for monopoles for a long time for a few reasons. One is, and without getting into all the details of it, in the standard model of physics, there should be monopoles. They should exist. They have to be able to exist because... Well, is it that they should exist or they can exist? Well... Like it, I, I thought just from reading the article, yeah. it, was, it seemed more like they were saying there is room for this in the math, whether or not we can find it. So here's the better way to say that. In the same way that we look at elemental particles as being the actions by which forces interact. So in terms of electricity, we look at the electron and how the electron moves to create what we call electricity. There should be a form of that for just magnets themselves. And if there were a form of that for magnets themselves, then monopoles would be possible. We don't know if that is the case, but in the standard model in which it is, there should be those things. They should exist somehow, somewhere. The thing that makes monopoles really interesting, too, is think of what you could do with them. This is another thing I did when I was like six or seven years old, not realizing that a perpetual motion machine couldn't exist. I... Uh, set up a thing like a ring of magnets and then tried to get another put another magnet in there thinking that it would perpetually move around going faster and faster and faster i actually did it with a a wheel like a moving wheel and put magnets along the edge and was hoping i could angle magnets in such a way to get this magnet moving faster and faster faster what Bobby's not telling you is that afterwards he went all sorcerer's apprentice on those magnets out of rage. Yeah, that's I right. He was attacked by a bunch of magnets. That's how I tried to make monopoles. <laughs> I just smashed that thing with a hammer. The problem is 
again, that magnet has a north side and a south side, north pole and a south pole. Because of that, whatever push it is pushing on those magnets as it's going around in a circle, it's also pulling equally from the other side. And so you essentially, yeah, you can kind of make a little fun device like that and spin it and have it spin kind of fast and it looks kind of neat, but it'll never really become a perpetual motion machine because the other side of that magnet is always slowing it down. However, if you had a monopole magnet, imagine this is a theoretical concept. Think of building a loop and that loop is all the south ends of magnets facing inwards. Now you have a completely south-facing magnet loop. If you were to put a north monopole magnet in there, it would have to continually spin, spin around faster and faster and faster because of the, the acceleration of it, because of the forces involved. But we don't have monopoles. So theoretically, you might be able to create something that was like a perpetual motion machine. Now, who knows if the physics in this works? Maybe the forces end up balancing out or well, in some we way. I know that you couldn't get a patent on it. That's if true. You, if you didn't yeah. bet the technology. By, by that same logic, wouldn't a uh, an electron and a positively char charged wheel mm -hmm. work for perpetual motion as long as it's not traveling You're through You're saying the electron itself going through it? Yeah, so if there is a ring of positive charge right. and then you have a negatively charged yeah. particle. You just described a particle accelerator. Right. Yeah, but, but the problem is you can't get any power from that, right? You could smash the fuck out of some atoms, though. <laughs> <up. laughs> yeah, yeah. Does that make it a perpetual motion machine? No, because what are you going to, like, are you going to attach something to that electron to, like, run something? You know, like, as opposed to a monopole magnet, which actually would be something that you could actually derive power from its moving around. I'm trying to picture a way to fund science by getting a Joe Sixpack and Captain Middle America uh -huh. in on this is to really frame the particle accelerator like uh, the same way you frame like a monster truck rally. Like, we're going to smash some atoms. <laughs> Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. You think you're too small to evade being smashed? Think again, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> so for it's a just a guy named Adam. <laughs> <laughs> he just yeah. punched in the stomach repeatedly <laughs> by a guy named Accelerator with a t-shirt on. John Cena. <laughs> I and like it. <laughs> this is how we finally beat the Asians in science. <laughs> so we have been looking for monopoles for a long time for that exact reason. What's really interesting in this article details that we have a link on our website is the differential search for monopoles in two different ways. One is a whole group of scientists who are looking for these monopoles in the large reactions in things like particle accelerators. So they go to these big particle accelerators, these very high energetic reactions, particles smashing into each other at near the speed of light to see if any monopoles come out. It's really interesting as to how they do this because, again, these would be very, very small. So one of the things they do is they wrap what is essentially sheets of plastic around where these particular collisions happen. To keep them fresh. <laughs> no, Damien. It's because a monopole should be able to shoot through those pieces of plastic in such a manner that it would create a straight shot all the way through them. And then they actually have an even better end of this detector where it's a big sheet of aluminum where these monopoles would essentially embed themselves. What's really neat about that is... If one of these monopoles that was essentially, let's say it's just a north monopole, right? So it shoots through these plastic, leaving a telltale trail and hits into this aluminum. What it ends up doing is creating a current in that aluminum because it's constantly a north magnet, right? And so it creates an imbalanced current in that aluminum that you can then pick up with electrical detectors. So part of this is basically having an aluminum sleeve around where these things collide and constantly checking in a very, very detailed way the current going through there. And if it's net zero, then no monopoles. If you do have a monopole in there, you do have a net current, which again leads me to believe that with a few monopoles, you could create something that creates an indefinite electricity. Wouldn't these scientists up their chances at discovering a monopole if they were to perhaps have some sort of personal monitoring device attached to a tinfoil hat mm. just as they're going about their business? I like this. Plastic. I like it. that hat. Maybe conspiracy theorists <laughs> should just hang out near CERN all day <laughs> with their, their tinfoil hats. Citizen scientists. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's one way that we are looking for them. We call this Moedal. It's a particular type of that plastic and aluminum technology that we use to try and find them. We have these set up and we are now looking for these in active experimentations. By the way, a fairly new technology, something that's just been added to a lot of large particle accelerators. So if this does turn out to be true, we will find out sometime soon. You know, this isn't something that's been in effect for 25 years. This is something we're just doing now. But there's a whole group of scientists who are looking for monopoles in a different place, which is just in nature. So we think that those monopoles might also be around from as remnants from the Big Bang or from very large collisions that happen out in space. So if that is true, they might be coming 
and kind of bombarding us without us even knowing. So we have to set up these large detectors that are able to detect whether or not a monopole is coming through. So not only are we wasting a vast amount of solar energy hitting us, uh -huh. we're wasting a vast amount of perpetual energy That's right. hitting us. <laughs> well, there are a few little tidbits that suggest we might have detected them already. There were some experiments in 1982. That was actually, I believe that one was at Stanford, uh, where they detected a possible cool. monopole. There was actually one also at Berkeley nearby where they actually launched a balloon up into the sky and might have discovered one like over Iowa or something like that. Pretty decent school. There is, <laughs> there are these little blips that, without getting into the details of it, because quite honestly I couldn't explain the details of it. But these little blips in the experiments that we would expect if we happen to read a single monopole coming through that do seem to jive with some of the results from very random studies. However, these are so broad based, they are basically unrepeatable because you can't set up the same thing and expect the same results. These are monopoles that could have traveled from millions and millions and millions of miles across the galaxy, happened to hit this one detector. They're not necessarily going to hit the same detector when you start it up again 2, 10, 20 years later. When Berkeley finds results, do they have to invite somebody from Stanford to come over and interpret the results? They invite them over to Stanford to show them how to actually discover things, considering <laughs> that the researchers from Berkeley have discovered 18 elements and people from Stanford still have yet to do one. But, you know. They focus their research on stuff that matters. Those elements, what are they oh, going to yeah. do? What do those fucking elements matter for? Yeah. You can't do shit yeah. with them. Why would matter even matter? Who would care about that, right? <laughs> it's matter that exists for less than a fucking second. <laughs> There's no return on that fucking investment. Uh, and these monopoles, if it's true, and we can confirm that they are found in nature, will be just as important as if we found them in a particle accelerator. So scientists are looking in really odd places, not just in these experiments and not just in these those kind of random things, but they're looking for them in a place where we look for something else that was really hard to find a long time ago, neutrinos. So neutrinos are essentially massless or near massless particles that move through us at all times. The neutrinos are bombarding our body and passing through us, passing through the earth. Neutrinos can essentially pass through matter very, very easily. So we have Neutrinos these... sound like a breakfast cereal bar for kids. <laughs> <laughs> they have these neutrino detectors, and the way they do them is they'll bore a hole 200 feet down into the solid ice in Antarctica, and they'll set up this detector that if it gets hit by a neutrino will emit a photon of light. You call it a detector, but isn't it just a huge tank of water? Yes, basically it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In some cases Drops they are. Sunny, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happens is... We can tell that it has to be something that is mostly massless because otherwise how would it get through the 200 plus feet of ice, right? So it has to be able to transmit through all that kind of stuff. We do this down in coal mines and stuff as well. So it's down below rock. And then it pretty much doesn't interact with matter. But every once in a while, statistically, because of the way stuff works on the quantum level, it does. So every once in a while, it'll pass through hundreds and hundreds of miles of rock and then boom, just interact with a big tank of water or something else. And that is how we set up neutrino detectors a long time ago. That's how we have basically validated the theory of neutrinos because those have gone off and we've been able to say, look, here are neutrinos. We can detect them. How many have we detected? And by we, I, I'm assuming us as a whole species gets credit for this. Right, yeah. <laughs> Damien takes the same approach to neutrino detection that a lot of sports fans take to winning a game. Like, what? how are we doing, guys? We won! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Man, I tell you, our O-line needs to really step it up. I'm gonna go talk to the boys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I do, to be honest, I don't know. I don't know. I think they, they basically got to a baseline and said, okay, we have neutrinos. We're good to go. We figured out that they're real. We can use a very similar detection method. In fact, in some of these cases, they're actually using neutrino detectors to try and detect monopoles because they would act in a very similar manner. Now, the hard part is then how do you distinguish between neutrinos and monopoles? Were we detecting monopoles the whole time before when we thought we were getting neutrinos? Who knows? But usually you just look up the skirt. That's, that's how you tell the difference? So I do for literally everybody because I don't see gender. It's a problem. <laughs> you, do, you meet a lot of men wearing skirts, though. I'm not complaining about the results. <laughs> So we're still differentiating how we can tell the difference between those two. But just understand, these are really interesting and diverse ways of going around the same scientific goal. We need to find neutrinos. Well, one is we would expect them in these really high energy collisions. So let's go look at particle accelerators, the biggest, most complicated devices human beings have ever made, and see what happens around those things. The other is, well, also we'd expect them from large natural collisions or the Big Bang itself. Let's look for them in the environment. And it's a really interesting thing that physics kind of has that almost nothing else has. There's very few times when you would do this type of investigation, looking in the most complicated things that have ever been made by human beings, and then also underneath a shit ton of ice to look for the exact same thing. And in this case, it's the only way to do it, right? And 
as we kind of start to be able to differentiate what happens in terms of the difference between neutrinos versus monopoles and how we'd be able to tell the difference between those two, again, it depends on the detector. Some detectors we, we feel we would be able to tell the difference. Other ones, we're not sure how we would yet. But as we get closer to that and as we start figuring out, yes, there is a monopole, no, there isn't, that might broadly change how we think of physics or it might confirm certain things that we currently think of physics. Question slightly off topic. Uh, you have to be a really smart mechanic to work on, what, as you said, one of the most complicated machines humans mm -hmm. beings have ever invented. I'm pretty sure it's the dudes from Car Talk. The dudes <laughs> from Car Talk. I think they're dead, right? Only one of them. Is. Yeah, okay. <laughs> he died in an accident working or repairing the fucking Hadron Collector. <laughs> <laughs> it was always interesting that they would talk about it because they were two mechanics, you know, in Massachusetts who both went to MIT and you're and they just like ran a car garage for 40 years. It sounded like extras from Goodwill Hunting. <laughs> yeah, they really did. But yet somehow they were both MIT grads. It was a, it was a good one. Yeah, I got my master's in automotive sciences. I majored in Miatas. Very interesting stuff, that monopole thing, while it just seems like, oh, it's half a magnet, no big deal. If you take it from that same journey that I've taken from a five-year-old smashing magnets with a hammer. To an adult smashing magnets yeah, with a particle to, accelerator. To someone now who can't even figure out how the fuck a neutrino detector works. <laughs> if you think about that, that's similar to kind of what we as a society are going through or would go through if we found it. As of right now, oh, monopole, that sounds like something interesting. Like, it's, I don't know, it sounds like something a stripper uses, I'm not sure. But then, too, this could really change the way we live our lives or or, or understand the universe around us, it's actually a really important part of, of physics and, and accepting or refuting parts of the standard model. Another thing that was really cool about that story, I thought, was the way that they discover the interaction between a, either a monopole or a neutrino is uh, they called it like the equivalent of a sonic boom, but for light. Yeah, for light. Where the particle is actually moving faster than light would in that environment. Yeah, because you think of light as the speed of light. That's only the speed of light in a vacuum. Right. Light travels very different speeds through different mediums. So like the speed of light in that silly tank of water is right. slower than they expect this particle to be moving in that tank of water, right. which is crazy. I had never even thought about it. Yeah, that I mean, they're, they actually, uh, I think last year we covered a story where they came up with a material that they could pass light through that slowed it down so much that you could see the light move through it. You could actually see the beam of light hit it and then go slowly through it. Now, by slowly, I still mean, you know, going a few hundred miles an hour, but you can see it. You can actually yeah. see the light move through so this then, material. So they mentioned this, like, sonic optical boom. I guess uh -huh. optical boom, not a sonic boom. But right. um, Is that the official then... title? Because that, that's the only <laughs> question I have. Maybe. We just made it up. Let's get on it, science. Yeah. I pictured like in, a, in an old cartoon where the wolf's eyes pop out uh, okay. and an attractive Bugs Bunny walks there by. There you go. Something. That's an optical boom. Yeah. <laughs> so could you visualize an optical boom yeah. with this substance you're talking about? Like pass a particle through it really quickly. Uh -huh. I don't know. What would that look like? Well, know. if it was a... If it was a non-light particle like they're looking at, you wouldn't see it, right? It would be going yeah. near the speed of light, so you wouldn't tell. If you pass light through it, you can literally see, because the material is also right. transparent. You can actually see it move through it very, very slowly. Yeah, so you wouldn't be able to see the optical boom. You would have to pass something through it that was also moving at a, like, viewable speed. Right, because what happens, like, some of our detectors basically say, as these very high-energy particles hit the atmosphere, they're hitting something and they're creating a cascade of events that essentially wash on down. And if you are observing the right spectrums and the right everything, you can see this. You can actually see this. And that's how some of those detectors work. you got to realize that what that means is that we're differentiating light speed, which is the speed light is technically supposed to travel at a vacuum, between the speed of these things that are traveling faster than light when it goes through this medium. So it's really interesting. When they do interact with that water, yeah. does it have any effect? Does it disturb the water at all? To the extent that it is doing that, yeah. So, well, so you I mean, would actually see this cascade. If you were looking in the right spectrum, again, this is not visible light, but if you're looking in the right spectrum, you would see this cascade of either some kind of photon or photon-like particle kind of moving through it. So there'd be no effect if, a, if one of these neutrinos were to interact close to you or inside in the water inside your well body. it probably does it, you know ne neutrinos we think that there are billions of neutrinos that are passing through your body at any given point and that maybe some of them interact there's an entire theory that maybe if they interact in the right way in just the right form maybe it, combustion yeah, yes they, no spontaneous human combustion yes, is yes, it yes sorry, of I'm course sorry, yeah no i'm sorry you died in your car engine yeah that's exactly <laughs> no it would never do that but <laughs> but it could theoretically and this would i don't know what the odds are on this it seems like it would be billions and billions of to one but much like photons from the sun can come and disturb just the right part of your DNA to cause skin cancer through melanoma, it could theoretically be possible that one of these neutrinos would react or interact with the mass of your body in just the right spot of your DNA to cause cancer. Theoretically. 
you could actually probably measure if you could figure out the frequency of that actually happening, of it interacting with random matter, and then how much is in your body at any given time. You could probably do a mathematical calculation and say so many percentage of cancers are caused by neutrinos at some point. Would wrapping yourself in tinfoil help prevent these cancers? Because I'm wondering if the conspiracy theorists ha- are onto something. Again, not interacting with matter, so going through it. Fair enough. <laughs> But very, very interesting stuff, super kind of heady and complex, but also really important in a weird way. So here's your takeaways. You should come away with this. Monopoles, very, very important to the standard model of physics. We haven't proven that they exist yet, but if we do, that will certainly make a very big difference in how we perceive the world, and it could help us with certain technological innovations. Maybe in 20 years, monopoles won't even be a thing. The same way, it's not even a big deal that we know that neutrinos exist now. You know, for a long time, it was theoretical. Now we know for sure they exist. Maybe that'll be the case with monopoles in 20 years, and that'll just be part of our understanding of the universe. But for now, figuring out that they actually do exist, either in man-made collisions like at CERN or other particle accelerators, or just in nature itself and we're observing them, would be a really big deal for physics. So look out for that in terms of news headlines coming up. All right, on to article number two. Did we just solve the antimatter problem? I think I speak for everybody when I say there was an antimatter problem. <laughs> yes. Not a matter problem <laughs> that Berkeley seems to want to keep adding to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we discussed this when we did our origins of the universe. That's what anti-Berkeleyum is just Stanfordium. Yeah. <laughs> it, has a, it has a mustache and a hat. <laughs> My favorite Stanford burn is that technically Stanford is Leland Stanford Jr. That's the guy's name who founded it, Leland Stanford Jr. College. And so we would always refer to it as Stanford Junior College. <laughs> no, no, not, not, not even Stanford, just that junior college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But we're more expensive to attend. (laughs) Yeah, like, so is, like, Southern Christian University. It doesn't mean it's good. Liberty University has, like, one of the highest tuitions. (laughs) You don't learn anything there. DeVry costs a surprising (laughs) penny. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Anyway, so, indeed, we talked about this when we talked about the origins of the universe. We talked about how, technically, we had expected that there would be an equal amount of antimatter and matter created during the Big Bang. That's what the mathematical models tell us. And that would mean that we wouldn't have anything left because all matter and antimatter, when they touch each other, they annihilate one another. So theoretically, what should have happened is after the Big Bang cooled off and matter came to be, matter coalesced, the matter should have touched the antimatter and obliterated everything. Now, we still think that's what happened for 99% of all of the matter on in the universe. It, it touched antimatter and went away. However, what we can't explain is why there's still matter now, why we have suns and moons and planets and stars and asteroid belts and black holes and everything. Why do we still have them? We shouldn't, right? There should have been no matter. It should have all touched antimatter and eradicated itself. And so there's been this question for a long time. Why does matter exist? Why was there more matter than antimatter? Or what happened to the antimatter where it's not around anymore? Think of Krypton, planet Krypton, as right. all matter and ant- and antimatter. Well, if it was matter I mean, and antimatter, it would no, annihilate it. Antimatter is Brainiac. What? <laughs> Destroying Krypton. <laughs> I feel we're, like you would have been better no, with... No, we're Superman. We, we, you we're had a the... better analogy with Bizarro World. That would have been much easier to do. <laughs> okay. Fucking put on a goddamn metaphor class for me here, Bobby. <laughs> so that's always been a very interesting question in physics. There is a model called the two Higgs doublet model, which actually adds four extra particles, not just two. But this model, which has been proposed in physics for a long time, again, it's a theoretical framework. So the two Higgs, one doublet model? <laughs> <laughs> Two Higgs doublet model, but yes, cl- <laughs> close. Uh, yeah, that's why nobody wants to watch a video of this model. <laughs> you know, you hear that that video was faked of the two Higgs <laughs> one doublet model. I just don't I don't know how. Even... I don't know how they could do it. Yeah, it's, that video put me off quantum ice cream for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> this theoretical model actually changes the possibilities and makes it so that maybe there would be more matter than antimatter at the creation of the universe. So again, we're not going to get into the super complex nature of this, mostly because I couldn't explain it to you. But there are some parts of this that are pretty accessible, even for the layperson. So the way this model would work is about 10 picoseconds after the Big Bang. So just say uh, not very much time at all, right after the Big Bang, uh, right about the time the Higgs boson was turning on. So we talked about the Higgs boson discovered in 2012, basically gives objects their mass. And after that was turning on, the universe was, this was still in that really hot plasma time. It turns out that due to the math that we see in this Higgs doublet model, it turns out that the heavier, slower moving particles don't matter very much when these new rules are imposed. So we end up with much, a much less complicated theory. Because of that, we can put this into computer simulations, which are a little bit more accurate than the previous theories, which you could only go so far. You could go like a second or two outside of the Big Bang before everything starts 
breaking down because it gets so complicated, right? We talked about that in terms of gravitational dynamics in, in orbits a few weeks ago, how you, you can only really project so far in the future before all of the math becomes too complicated and you can't do much anymore. So in the sim more simplified version, these computer simulations, they tell you about how violently out of equilibrium the universe was when the Higgs turned on. So basically, the universe explodes, the Higgs turns itself on very shortly afterwards. Because of the disturbance and the violent nature of the universe at that time as the, the Higgs turns on, there could be an asymmetry in matter-antimatter, a very slight one. But again, all you would need was an incredibly slight asymmetry in matter and antimatter to is, see what we is currently see. this basically see. due to the inherent quantum fluctuations? Yes, the inherent quantum fluctuations, but also think about it this way. Think of an explosion happening. Now you freeze frame that explosion. Every, in, every Michael Bay movie going on in my right, right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> boom, Michael, boom, boom. I, I was really sad that Michael Bay signed up for uh, two bosons, one cup. <laughs> If you freeze frame at any given point in the middle of that explosion, it's not necessarily going to be equally distributed at that exact freeze frame. Now, if you were to overall take the overall forces of any given explosion, they would balance out, right? The force on one side would have to equal the force on the other. That's the only way it would work, assuming this is in space and there's nothing, there's no other forces acting upon it. However, at any given point during the initial part of that explosion, one side might be slightly off to the other, or there might be slight differences in the levels of force vis-a-vis -vis one side to the other. Now, those will equal out over the average, but in that immediate point in time, there might be an asymmetry. Now, imagine if in, in that immediate point in time, the thing that gives matter its mass turned on. Hmm. If you have a slight okay. asymmetry at that exact moment, you could have a very slight difference between matter and antimatter, which is all we would need to see all of what we see out there right now. What we think of as this massive universe, which is massive, of suns and stars and quasars and black holes and pulsars and planets and Kepler belts, all that stuff, it could be accounted for just by that slight differential 10 picoseconds after the Big Bang. So wait, we matter. Yes, we do matter. Is a mistake. Like, like we are, we, yes. we, and we are the cause of why our parents, matter and antimatter, got yes. a divorce. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they didn't get a divorce, they murdered each other. <laughs> because of the pregnancy. Yeah, yeah they were, that was, what was much worse than a divorce. It's not like they decided to hang out on their different sides of the galaxy. <laughs> This will all be covered in Michael Bay's adaptation of, of the two bo boson. I'm just right. upset that, once again, the studios have ignored the fan base and gone with Michael Bay uh, and ignoring the source content. Yeah, again, now, all the specifics of this aren't important. What's important is the math on this, the computer simulations on this, seem to suggest that if this is the case, if this particular model is how the universe works, if this represents the, the universe as it ac actually is, then all of a sudden this thing, which is one of the biggest mysteries in all of physics, honestly, if you talk to anybody about some of the, the most basal mysteries of physics, the fact that matter exists instead of being annihilated will be a big one of any person who knows what they're talking about. This huge mystery may well be solved by this model. This model provides a route by which the universe, as we currently see it, could exist in the way that we see it, which, while seemingly just a normal thing, like, oh, what, your model fits the universe? This is the first one that does that. We have no other model that can account for the existence of matter, which sounds like a crazy statement, but we literally don't. We, have, we don't have a model of physics other than this one that can account for the existence of matter. And by the way, this model of physics, which isn't necessarily brand new, it is fairly new, but this particular model of physics was just kind of put into these computer simulations because it is possible with this particular model, just shot out this answer. Meaning up until two weeks ago, there was no real good physics explanation for why matter existed. I feel like this isn't garnering the same type of attention as if like science had some sort of theory for the universal field theory or something. Right. I mean, I, I unified field theory. I'm oh, sorry, unified field theory. Right. No, I'm talking about universal health care. OK, I forgot know, you. For people who work in the field. <laughs> I, I would love that. <laughs> No, I, I mean, you're saying it's one of the biggest science mysteries. I'm like, right. how, how come How come IFL Science hasn't misreported this shit yet? I'll tell you this, Bill. I don't know if you had this experience, but when I was first learning about the antimatter matter problem, I was really perplexed. I was very, very interested in how this could have happened. And I was more interested in the fact that the professor teaching me, who was very intelligent, very smart, and knew a lot about physics, was couldn't answer that question either. Like, <laughs> why is it that this guy, who has spent his life doing physics, who, ha who knows more about physics than probably everybody else in the world, save two or three people, how come he's not flipping out about this? I remember sitting in that class and thinking... Wait, hold on. Wait, wait, stop the class. We don't know why matter exists. Why isn't anyone talking about this? Do you think he only told the students he liked? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he knew. He knew. He just kept the secret. Or students who put out. Yeah. <laughs> put out 
papers. Put out papers, yeah, right? Yeah. And receive dick. <laughs> I mean, that was back at the time when we were also still looking for things like particles that would explain gravity, which we've kind of found with Higgs and a few other things. So there were other big mysteries in physics. But to me, that was always a really big one that people just seem to brush over. Yeah, we don't know why there's matter. There shouldn't be matter. Our current model said there shouldn't be. We don't know why there is. And nobody seemed hung up on it. I've had this question since the start, but it was kind of off, so I wanted to wait till the end of the article. Mm -hmm. If the Higgs boson gives matter form, is it possible that some people, just in the vein that some people are big bone, that some people are genetically predisposed to just have more mass, they, they have more Higgs boson? Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I'm not fat. I'm... I'm, I'm Higgs. <laughs> I'm Higgs. <laughs> I'm Higgs boned? <laughs> Two Higgs, one bone. Wait, so your, your particles are more interactive with Higgs bosons? You are like stickier. Yes, of. I I stick to more matter everywhere I go. <laughs> Touch me. <laughs> I'll let me absorb you. Uh yeah, so long story short, while it's it sounds like a complicated explanation and it is it does start knocking on the door of answering this really big question that not too many people realize we should have had. Not enough people know we should be asking this question, and it's very, very interesting. So we might be figuring out that question as well soon. So very, very interesting article and very interesting episode. A little bit physics-heavy and complicated, but again, if you don't like the physics, come on back this Thursday for I Call BS. We'll get away from that a little bit. Kind of more of a blue episode, too, when you look at... It really it was, yeah. Yeah, there was Bill. a... The, speaking of holes, there was a lot of mention of them on this particularly <laughs> blue episode. Quantumized cream. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Bill, for coming back for 276. And thank you, audience, for coming back where you learned about the origin of the planets, all about how we're looking for monopoles, and how we might have just solved the matter problem. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back this Thursday for Science Faction 277. Hey, oh, I got a monopole for you right here, baby. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs>